and Heritage Institute series celebrating Native American Heritage Month. I am Chuck Smythe, Director of the Culture and History Department. The title of today's lecture is International Indigenous Human Rights and Introduction. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in the chat box on YouTube. Dr. Duro has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of her presentation. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Daly Sambo Duro, who is Inuit from Alaska. She is the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, a non-governmental organization that represents approximate, approximately 180,000 Inuit from the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. She holds a PhD from the University of British Columbia Faculty of Law and a Master's of Arts in Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She is affiliated with the University of Alaska Anchorage, where she served as an Assistant Professor of International Relations within the Department of Political Science from 2008 to 2018. Her current UAA title is Senior Scholar and Special Advisor on Arctic Indigenous Peoples. Serving as an expert member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for two consecutive three-year terms, she held the position of chairperson from 2014 to 2015. She was also a member and chair of the Board of Trustees of the UN Voluntary Fund for Indigenous Peoples. Presently, she serves as the co-chair of the International Law Association Committee on Implementation of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Her past service to the ILA includes membership in the former, former Committee on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Dr. Duro. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck, for this um, opportunity. And also would like to extend my uh, thanks and my greetings to uh, Rosita Whirl as well. I have um, chosen to uh, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, which will provide a bit of background as to the development of international indigenous human rights standards at the international level, namely the United Nations, the International Labor Organization and the Organization of American States. And then also talk about its, uh, the relevance of these standards uh, within communities uh, in not only Alaska, but uh, for indigenous peoples across the globe. So allow me to uh, pull up my PowerPoint presentation. Again, thank you for the opportunity. For some reason that's not advancing. Let me just... Start again with the, maybe I, I chose the wrong, here we go. This is a, So the first thing that I wanna do is uh, define the term indigenous peoples. And I'll speak at the very end as to why this definition is important. I think that we as indigenous peoples have a pretty full understanding of who we are as distinct peoples, but it's important for the rest of the international community to understand the important elements of what makes us distinct from all others. And in particular, uh, I wanna say that uh, there is no formal adopted definition of the term indigenous peoples at the international level and certainly not within the United Nations. However, there's a working definition. And so this paragraph is uh, borrowed from the working definition that was originally developed by 
Martinez Cobo, who was a rapporteur that was assigned to do a voluminous study on the status and conditions of indigenous peoples across the globe. But the definition is important for a host of different reasons. And uh, the elements that are highlighted in the working definition of the UN is this historical continuity with pre-invasion, or the fact that we as indigenous peoples um, had a social order prior to um, colonial uh, encroachment in our communities. Also that we developed uh, over millennia on our own territories, that we consider ourselves distinct from other sectors in society. It's common to refer to civil societies at the United Nations, but Frankly, indigenous peoples are not under the umbrella of civil society. In fact, we're distinct from those you know, other citizens uh, across countries around the globe uh, based upon our inherent or pre-existing rights. Also that this, this sense, uh, and I know this is a shared understanding among indigenous people, certainly in Alaska and elsewhere, that we are determined to preserve and develop and transmit to our future generations, not only our ancestral lands, territories and resources, but also our cultural identity. And uh, this psychological force and sense is critical for indigenous peoples. And that we're doing so in accordance with our own cultural patterns, so social institutions, legal systems, and, and other customs and values and practices. Before I get into a discussion about the human rights standard setting exercises, I think it's important for people to understand the nature of human rights. First of all, they're universal. They apply to every individual and to all peoples. Again, they're, they're universal and they attach to you the moment you're born as a human being. They're attached to your legal status as a, as a human being. Also, they're interrelated, interdependent, interconnected and indivisible. And by this, I mean that if you toy with one element or one particular human right, it's going to have impacts upon all of your other human rights. We can uh, identify a host of different examples of how human rights are interrelated. So for example, when you go to the voting booth and uh, the, the ballot is not in your language, well, Obviously, you've been infringed upon in terms of uh, your right to understand and thereby your right to vote. And this is just one example of the interrelated nature of human rights. In addition, they're inalienable. They can't be destroyed or extinguished. It's one thing for a government to violate your human rights, but human rights cannot be destroyed. They're also, in the context especially of indigenous peoples, they're inherent or pre-existing rights. They're not given by a government. They're inherent in your legal status as a human being. And indeed for indigenous peoples and their collective rights, they're inherent in our collective rights as distinct peoples, as is illustrated in the definition of the term indigenous peoples. I won't spend a lot of time on the chronology of major events and I'm gonna actually jump over huge chunks of history in this presentation, but it is significant to recognize that in 1923, Descahe, as a leader of the Haudenosaunee people or otherwise known as the Iroquois Confederacy, made efforts to pry open the doors of the preceding League of Nations uh, it preceded uh, the United Nations, but because of the range of treaty violations that he and his people were experiencing, he was sent as a diplomatic envoy to the League of Nations in order to raise uh, his voice and the voice of their people uh, with regard to uh, abrogations of their treaty rights. 
He was not successful in opening the doors of the League of Nations, but it is significant that the then city of Geneva welcomed him and embraced his efforts. And to this day, there is a, an important relationship between the Haudenosaunee and the city of Geneva. Also in 1925, Ratana, a Maori chief uh, in relation to the Treaty of Waitangi, they too were experiencing abrogations of their treaty rights and he was sent by the Maori people to do the same. Both were unsuccessful, but this is really significant in terms of indigenous peoples and their history of international engagement, but even more importantly, recognizing indigenous peoples as both subjects and objects of international law. And if we think about the family of nations, there's no question that indigenous peoples, communities, and nations are a part of the family of nations. Another significant thing about uh, the major events, and I've already spoken about Jose Martinez Cobo and the working definition adopted by the United Nations, but it's highly significant that he was appointed to do a study on the status and conditions of indigenous peoples across the globe. And if you recognize that there are over 450 million indigenous peoples around the world, this was a huge task, but he took a pretty, um, a pretty organized structured uh, approach to his particular study. I also wanna note that in the context of these early events that there was a significant conference that was held in 1977 in Geneva, which happens to be the seat of the um, human rights portfolio of the United Nations. That conference in 1977 focused upon racism and racial discrimination against the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And many of uh, those involved in the American Indian movement in the United States or North America generally were engaged in that conference. It is also significant that uh, myself and other Inuit here in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland organized the first Inuit Circumpolar Council conference in Ukiavik, Alaska in June of 1977. So all of this um, suggests a, a extraordinary awareness and also political organizing on the part of indigenous peoples, certainly in North America, as well as the Arctic. Throughout the 1980s, uh, a number of different um, events took place and I'll just mention um, two of them. The uh, General Assembly and the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations specifically, on the recommendation of Martinez Cobo, adopted a resolution to establish the Working Group on Indigenous Populations. And the twofold mandate of the Working Group and the five independent experts that were assigned by their parent body, the Subcommission, um, was to number one, continue the review of the status and conditions of indigenous peoples worldwide, but number two, begin the drafting of a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples because it was recognized that there was a gap within the human rights regime within the United Nations, uh, a gap specifically concerning indigenous peoples and their particular cultural context. Many may know that the tradition of human rights has often been couched in a very European orientation or European approach that these human rights attach to us only as individuals. Obviously, indigenous peoples as collectivities, as communities, um, this is an example of how uh, big the gap was for indigenous peoples. So 1982, the Economic and Social Council establishes the Working Group on Indigenous Populations. Um, in addition, throughout the 1980s, uh, some important events took place. 1984, a significant meeting of the World Council of Indigenous Peoples took place in Panama City and knowing the mandate of the Working Group on Indigenous Populations, Indigenous peoples themselves began to draft 
their own declaration in order to influence what was taking place within the WGIP. In addition, later uh, in 1988 and 1989, the International Labor Organization, recognizing that the United Nations was undertaking this effort to establish human rights standards specific to indigenous peoples, and at the same time, uh, were being criticized by indigenous peoples for their outdated and assimilationist convention or legally binding treaty that was adopted by the ILO in 1957, they chose to initiate a revision process that took place in 1988 and 1989 and resulted in the adoption of the only legally binding international human rights instrument concerning indigenous peoples it was adopted in 1989 and it is ILO convention number 169. For myself, I was fortunate to uh, participate in that revision process in 1988 and 1989, as well as on behalf of Inuit and other organization to, to I was able to participate in the work uh, of um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, essentially from 1984 until it was concluded in 2007. And I'll get into that a bit, a bit further. Throughout the 1990s, um, the work of the Working Group on Indigenous Populations, so the original WGIP as it's referred to, uh, which was headed by Erica Irene Diaz, a diplomat from Greece, um, this is a photo of her in this uh, particular slide. Uh, under her direction, and she's fondly referred to uh, often by many as the grandmother of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, they concluded their work under her direction in 1993. Then they handed it to their parent body, the body that uh, appointed her and four other human rights experts. So this, the, the draft declaration, which indigenous peoples heavily influence, largely because of the open democratic forum that she created in the working group on indigenous populations. And, um, if it weren't for the force of Descahe, Ratana, and indigenous peoples uh, throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, we probably wouldn't have been allowed in the door to influence the document itself. And if one were to pick up a copy of what Erica Diaz delivered to uh, the parent body, the subcommission in those days, you would recognize what appears in the final document that was adopted by the General Assembly in 2007. So this is to say that we had extraordinary influence and honestly, indigenous peoples uh, based upon just their, their political force alone, as well as the substance as to how human rights apply within our nations, communities, and amongst our peoples. Um, I mean, this, this force alone really changed the way that human rights standard setting is done within the United Nations. Not only did we offer uh, the distinct area of collective human rights to the human rights regime at the UN, but also the fact that the processes have to be more open, more transparent, more democratic. And I think this is a significant accomplishment on the part of indigenous peoples. So in 1994, the subcommission adopted the draft that came from the WGIP, and then they forwarded it to their parent body, then the Commission on Human Rights. This is where things got very, very interesting because the WGIP and uh, the subcommission are very open democratic fora. The Commission on Human Rights, however, is comprised of actual nation state representatives, UN member state representatives. And of course, they wanted to whitewash the declaration and uh, begin to diminish the standards that we effectively influence. So it became a highly political discussion. In um, 
1995, in fact, the Commission on Human Rights wanted to limit the participation of indigenous peoples to only those organizations that had received economic and social council, non-governmental organization status. 1983, the Inuit Circumpolar Council had that status. So by 1995, we were allowed in the door, but this then silenced or had the potential of silencing huge numbers of indigenous peoples from across the globe. So it took the effort of indigenous peoples to fashion a resolution that was ironically enough carried by the United States government to ensure that indigenous peoples in particular, those that don't have non-governmental organization status were allowed in the door in order to influence the document that was up for consideration in a series of intersessional working group meetings on the draft declaration. When I say it was highly politicized, I specifically mean that the governments of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States took every opportunity that they possibly could to diminish the standards. And in particular, the standards of the language um, found in relation to the right of self-determination, also the language found uh, in relation to indigenous people's rights to lands, territories, and resources, as well as hunting, fishing, and other harvesting rights. Um, this slide illustrates a host of different things that took place throughout the 2000s. Uh, it's significant that a number of very specific uh, bodies in the United Nations were uh, created uh, throughout this period, but even more importantly, the effort um, by the Commission on Human Rights um, was really, um, I, I don't know how to characterize it in, in, in brief terms, but um, it, was a, it was one of the most heart-wrenching exercises that we engaged in to defend the declaration that we had influenced. And by and large, in, in my estimation, the document um, has held true to the original draft that emerged from the WGIP. Some of you may know that the Commission on Human Rights was then disbanded uh, under criticism from the United States and others that it was a highly politicized uh, forum where you had uh, East, uh, East versus West uh, views about how the Commission on Human Rights was being used. The United States also complained about uh, duplication and the high cost of the Commission on Human Rights. And in that context, the UN human rights regime went under reform. And what emerged uh, in 2006 was the establishment of the Human Rights Council. The first session of the Human Rights Council after um, the scrubbing, or at least the attempted scrubbing of the declaration by states, uh, at the first session of the new Human Rights Council, and that you could devote an entire lecture just to the Human Rights Council, but what's important here is that the first session of the Human Rights Council, they adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with a resolution urging the United Nations General Assembly uh, to adopt the declaration. So the declaration physically went from Geneva, Switzerland, to the headquarters of the United Nations in New York uh, with the urging from the Human Rights Council to adopt the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Fortunately, September 13th, 2007, the UN General Assembly, unfortunately, by a vote, adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I wanted to uh, recall the uh, important um, work of the ILO in relation to the Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples. And I mention it largely because um, some of our membership in Greenland, uh, because the Danish realm 
acceded to or ratified ILO convention number 169, it is relevant to um, some of our people and uh, the government of Denmark is legally bound to uphold uh, the standards contained in ILO convention number 169. And it is again, the only legally binding international treaty concerning indigenous peoples, but it has only enjoyed 22 ratifications. If uh, you hold that against the backdrop of the fact that there are 193 nation states, uh, might 171 of them are missing in terms of this international legally binding treaty. Nevertheless, the ILO themselves have pronounced that the ILO convention number 169 from 1989 now that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has been adopted, that these two instruments are complementary and mutually reinforcing. So the ILO themselves in their analysis have linked these two instruments uh, together. And this is really important, especially when we talk about how to implement the rights of Indigenous Peoples. So the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in my estimation, is the most comprehensive international human rights instrument concerning Indigenous Peoples. We effectively filled the gap that existed in the UN human rights regime. Uh, the document affirms the right of Indigenous Peoples to self-determination. It affirms our rights to lands, territories, and resources. It also affirms the right of indigenous peoples to free prior and informed consent, a right to participate in decision-making that affects us and, and our rights. Also protection from the destruction of our culture, a right to security, including cultural security, food security, and a host of other different matters. In addition to the UN declaration uh, and the ILO convention, the Organization of American States, which is the regional organization for the Americas, uh, in 2016, they adopted the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Interestingly enough, uh, after the ILO revised convention number 107 in 1988 and 1989, the OAS decided that they too uh, will adopt an instrument specific to indigenous peoples because of the high number of indigenous peoples across the Americas. Now, that instrument also invokes the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we now have a trilogy of instruments. You have ILO Convention number 169, you have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and you now also have the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So getting into some of the nitty gritty, it's important to underscore that in 1966, the United Nations, and when I say United Nations, I mean specifically the member states, the nation states of the United Nations adopted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and they also adopted the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. With the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, this is often referred to as the Bill of Rights uh, in a comprehensive fashion, these three instruments. But the reason why they're important here in our context is that Article 1 affirms that all peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. If one thinks about it, this is everything, right? Uh, that we, we, as indigenous peoples, have the right of self-determination, this inherent pre-existing right. We should be able to determine our political status and freely pursue our economic, social, and cultural development. For Alaska Natives, paragraph two is quite significant. And again, this was a, these instruments, these two instruments, they're, they're legally binding treaties. These two instruments were adopted in 1966. Five years after the adoption of the International Covenants, and I have to say that uh, the, 
Article one is a twin covenant. It's the exact same language in the one on civil and political rights as the one on economic, social, and cultural rights. The very last sentence of article one, paragraph two, this is huge in my opinion. In no case may a people be deprived of its own means of subsistence. There's no room to move. In no case, in no way, shape or form should a people be deprived of their own means of subsistence. Unfortunately, in 1971, the United States government had not acceded to the international covenants. It took them, I don't know how many years, but June 1992, the United States government ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So this standard that we have the right of self-determination and in no case should we be deprived of our own means of subsistence is the present international standard of the United States government. And this language is, is you can't get any more uh, powerful than this in terms of our rights as distinct peoples. This language was used by advocates of indigenous peoples in an attempt to uh, ensure that Article I attached to indigenous peoples uh, throughout the 1970s. And um, this was sort of the, 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 the entrance gate to application of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the acronym for the, the, the ICCPR. And so uh, the rights of those belonging to uh, minorities and who exercise their rights in community with others, which is essentially a, a collective rights uh, provision, um, that this should be used as a way to uh, trigger the treaty bodies and the scrutiny of states and their violations of our basic civil and political rights. Um, but that didn't take place until well, it still isn't taking place if, if, uh, if you think about implementation of, of the standards. But this is, this is uh, uh, probably indicative of the early efforts of uh, advocates, of indigenous peoples, human rights advocates, to utilize language to access um, uh, the scrutiny of the UN human rights regime. It's also important to recognize that the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination adopted in 1965 um, provided important reference points for indigenous peoples in their arguments to safeguard the right of self-determination during the Commission on Human Rights where governments and especially the Kansas group, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States were working to diminish uh, and, and deny the attachment of the right of self-determination as understood in international law, specifically to indigenous peoples. And our argument rested upon part one, article one of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So it's the, it's one of the few, if, if not the only international treaty that has a definition of its subject matter, racial discrimination. Racial discrimination shall mean any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin, which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, or any other field of public life. So not only would uh, the intent have uh, the purpose, but also uh, the potential effect of denying the rights of peoples. And in this case, our argument was that if governments tried to create a different understanding of the right of self-determination and its application to us as indigenous peoples, it would be racially discriminatory because they're utilizing it to treat 
indigenous peoples differently. And this really was the argument that won the day in terms of safeguarding uh, the article that eventually emerged um, in the September 13, 2007 adoption by the General Assembly of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Recall the language from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 1. This is Article 3 from the UN Declaration. Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. This was a hard fought battle. Governments were trying to put forward language that would confine us uh, in nation state status. Uh, they came up with all kinds of arguments that, for example, indigenous peoples only have the internal right to self-determination or that uh, the right of self-determination can be only understood in a colonial context, um, that indigenous peoples didn't have the capacity to exercise the right of self-determination at the international level, that they didn't have the opportunity or capacity to, uh, uh, in the form of self-government or autonomy, engage in international relations. Uh, there was a whole host of arguments, including uh, the argument that the term peoples should not be used because of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. You see the, you see the plural use of the term uh, peoples. Governments tried all kinds of intellectually dishonest efforts uh, to deny the application of the right of self-determination to us as indigenous peoples, um, largely because they want to control us. Um, if you think about uh, statements by the US government, for example, as this common refrain of our indigenous peoples, you know, this kind of wrap their arms around us and, and control uh, how in fact we will exercise self-determination. One of the other um, uh, compelling arguments was that, well, we're here at the United Nations. We're externally exercising our right of self-government and our right of self-determination by sitting across the table from you um, to defend our rights. Uh, so not only are we engaged at home and in our communities as tribal governments, as First Nations, um, as, as uh, uh, Maori um, uh, political institutions or Australian Aboriginal political institutions, but we're right here right now at the international level, externally expressing our views and concerns about our rights and our interests. Quickly, um, Article 20 uh, echoes the language found in Article 1 that Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and develop their political, economic, and social systems or institutions to be secure in the enjoyment of their own means of subsistence. This is, this is important language, and it certainly is important to Alaska Native people and the purported extinguishment of our Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights in 1971. Again, that could be a, a lecture of, of all of its own. Article 25 uh, makes specific reference to the distinctive spiritual relationship that we have as indigenous peoples to our lands, territories, and resources. This language originally used to say sea ice. Um, it is, uh, it, because sea ice is not universal, it didn't uh, survive. Um, the negotiation process, but is an example of how Inuit influenced the language of the UN Declaration. Also, uh, there's reference to conservation and protection of uh, our environments, the productive capacity of our lands, territories, and resources. If you think about this in the context of climate change, this is, this is huge and important. The other thing I have to say is that I'm pointing out several different specific articles, but again, remember that all of these articles are interrelated, interdependent, interconnected, and indivisible. So this standard setting exercise um, did a number of different things. It triggered a bunch of different developments like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, 
discussion of indigenous peoples and their rights within the World Bank. Uh, also um, at the Rio conference in 1992, there's a reference specifically to indigenous peoples on the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, the Food and Agricultural Organization is preparing for a food system summit. Uh, of course, they're asking indigenous peoples what their views and perspectives happen to be. Obviously, it triggered uh, the OAS uh, to pursue an exercise to adopt a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. And there's a whole host of other things. I'm going to quickly turn to um, the human rights regime within uh, the United Nations. Um, I've spoken about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is uh, shown on this chart. This is a chart of the treaty system uh, within the United Nations. And all of the acronyms across in the diamonds uh, above are the legally binding international instruments concerning all human rights. And of course, indigenous peoples are beneficiaries of all of these instruments as well. Um, and I, I raise this because um, this is the regime in which indigenous peoples can gain recourse and uh, pursue complaints in order to gain redress for the violation of their human rights. There's important jurisprudence that's emerging out of these various different committees that are set up to monitor the behavior of states under every international treaty that a state accedes to. And you can find a wealth of information on the internet and the UN website specifically as to the actions of these various different treaty bodies. Um, but it is significant that even before the declaration was adopted. In its draft form, these treaty bodies started to look at issues of concern for indigenous peoples or in, in favor of indigenous peoples, just on the basis of the draft declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. So the treaty body jurisprudence um, comes in the form of um, submissions by indigenous people, sometimes in the form of a shadow report, sometimes in the form of a formal complaint about the violation of rights. And the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is now becoming a subject of concern for uh, every one of these treaty bodies. Um, so not only do they comment on the basis of individual human rights, but also in general observations and recommendations or general comments. A number of them have been developed um, by the treaty bodies specifically concerning indigenous peoples. Also, uh, they can gain uh, the advice of the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, which was created by the Human Rights Council. I'll get to that in, in just a second. But also um, the special procedures of the Human Rights Council and the special rapporteurs or independent experts that offer information to the treaty bodies and the human rights experts that uh, review uh, complaints um, and also shadow reports that come in from indigenous peoples. And that's the other way in which you can influence the, uh, the jurisprudence. So, for example, um, every government uh, that accedes to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is required to offer a, a report every five years. If we had a, con uh, a commentary on how um, our hunting, fishing, and harvesting rights are not being uh, honored or respected or recognized, we could offer a shadow report to the United States government's report indicating exactly how uh, the right is being infringed. Quickly, I'll talk about the work of the International Law Association. Um, the International Law Association is a body of uh, legal scholars and uh, jurists or former jurists uh, across the globe. And um, it now holds a status, uh, an elevated status um, in that the United Nations uh, can seek the advice of the International Association 
on issues that uh, require uh, further in-depth legal analysis. Thus far, uh, as Chuck indicated in the introduction, uh, in the introduction of myself, that uh, the International Law Association has undertaken an expert commentary on the content of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They have recognized that it has diverse legal effects uh, and that though the whole of the UN Declaration is not legally binding like a treaty or a convention, certain provisions are in the neighborhood of either general principles of international law or customary international law. And the reason why this is important is that it kicks in significant legal obligations by UN member states to adhere to those general principles of international law. And in terms of the provisions in the UN declaration, it includes the right of self-determination, the right to culture, right to redress and reparations, for example. Um, so this is, a, this is an important commentary. Um, since that uh, particular committee concluded its work, uh, we have put forward a committee on the implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples and uh, December 5th, in just a few days, uh, the International Law Association, of which I'm the co-chair of, we will be releasing our report on, um, unfortunately, the lack of uh, concrete implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples by uh, nation states. One important thing about all of this activity is that these are not new rights. Rather, we have offered as indigenous peoples who are beneficiaries to all human rights, we have offered the distinct cultural context of indigenous peoples to inform the human rights regime, to inform the human rights system that treatment of our issues and our peoples and our individuals is distinct from all other individuals. So again, it's important to recognize that these are not new rights, but rather our understanding of the content, our worldviews, our perspectives as to our rights as distinct Indigenous peoples. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I, I'll just quickly, quickly say that um, absolutely the right of self-determination is understood in international law by legal scholars across the globe as a prerequisite, meaning that it's required in order for us to exercise and enjoy all other human rights. So self-determination is foundational. It is a core right of indigenous peoples. It is also one whole right. You know, the arguments that states were trying to make that, oh, you have only internal self-determination. And now some states are saying because of Article 4, which talks about self-government and autonomy, that that somehow cuts off or limits the exercise of our right of self-determination wherever we choose to do so. But that's not the case. Self-determination is one whole right. And if we recognize the equal application of the rule of law, and especially against racial discrimination, um, it, it, it hands down, uh, the right of self-determination as understood in international law equally applies to all indigenous peoples. Um, the right to free prior and informed consent is deserved of a, of a discussion all of its own, but as you might imagine, the right to free prior and informed consent is sourced in the right of self-determination. It's an element of the right of self-determination. And if you were to look at issues related to extractive industries or, or otherwise, um, free prior and informed consent is an expression of the right of self-determination. Uh, in addition, I've already talked about the rights of indigenous peoples to our lands, territories, and resources. Again, these are inherent rights, they're pre-existing rights. And the fact that the UN Declaration speaks of our spiritual relationship to our lands, territories, and resources this profound relationship has to also be 
understood. Um, I'll just quickly uh, conclude by indicating that uh, a number of different bodies uh, that are indigenous specific have developed really as a result of uh, this whole exercise to establish human rights specific to indigenous peoples at the international level. So in 1985, the UN Voluntary Trust Fund for Indigenous Peoples was created and uh, those who uh, seek to participate in any meeting at the United Nations that is of specific concern to Indigenous peoples can apply to the Voluntary Fund to gain uh, financial support to attend a particular meeting. Also in 2000, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues was created. This entity is a, uh, an interesting body of representatives uh, that sit in equal status from UN member states and also those nominated by indigenous peoples. Um, so it's a, a significant uh, body which has the mandate essentially of saturating the whole United Nations system with uh, the views and concerns of indigenous peoples. In addition, in 2001, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was created. This slide uh, reflects um, uh, from left to right, uh, Rodolfo Stavenhagen, who was um, a, a, an extraordinary legal scholar, not of indigenous descent. Uh, he was from Mexico, but made um, some important contributions in the earliest days of of the human rights standard setting exercises. He was appointed as the first special rapporteur. He was succeeded by James Anaya, who is presently uh, as, an, as an indigenous person, the Dean of the Law School at University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, Victa uh, Victoria Tally Corpus, a um, indigenous woman from the Philippines, uh, just um, uh, concluded her term and uh, the new special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples is Francisco Calize, an indigenous person from uh, Guatemala who uh, just began um, his term as the special rapporteur about uh, three or four months ago. And interestingly enough, his first study is focused on the impacts of COVID-19 on indigenous peoples and communities. Um, the Human Rights Council, I've referred to the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, this is a body that provides specific advice to the Human Rights Council. It was established in uh, 2007 and consists of five individual human rights experts that are either of indigenous or non-indigenous descent. Um, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues engages in a host of different studies. Their website is worth uh, visiting to see the list of studies. Um, I mentioned uh, the efforts of states um, attempting to diminish the rights of indigenous peoples. This happens to be the title of one of the studies that I was engaged in at the Permanent Forum. Uh, which suggests that we need to be ever vigilant about what governments are doing in terms of uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. I just quickly want to, there's a lot of negative stuff I can say about how governments are not implementing the UN declaration. Uh, it's extraordinary that the government of Canada is in national dialogue and debate about how to adopt federal legislation to implement the UN Declaration. It's significant that the uh, province of British Columbia has uh, adopted uh, provincial legislation to implement the UN Declaration, but it is few and far between that we see governments actively implementing these human rights standards. So it, it we have a heavy burden to see uh, progress in this regard, but there are some positive examples. Um, recently, the International Whaling Commission uh, undertook a number of different decisions, including the fact that um, the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission no longer has to come forward and make arguments about the cultural significance of Aboriginal subsistence whaling. Um, a number of different books and uh, handbooks and also the guiding principles on business and human rights have uh, integrated the views of indigenous peoples. So um, in conclusion, the 
UN declaration, as I've said, it's not legally binding in the same way as other treaties are. But again, it has diverse legal effects. And uh, some of the provisions actually are in the neighborhood of customary international law. Also, um, I spoke earlier about Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. When they called for a vote in regard to the adoption of the UN Declaration in September 2007, um, and, and those four countries voted no, uh, finally, uh, the Obama administration in 2010 endorsed the UN Declaration as did Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So in my estimation, the UN Declaration now enjoys a universal consensus. And uh, even though the Russian Federation abstained from its vote, I think that the overwhelming force uh, that was generated by indigenous people over decades uh, has brought this uh, to a point of no return as far as a, a universal consensus about the important standards uh, that are reflected and affirmed in the UN Declaration and also um, those of the uh, specifically or explicitly related ILO Convention number 169 and the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So, in the end, um, there is an urgent need to implement these standards uh, at the local level, the regional level, the national level, at the international level. It'll be interesting to see what uh, might emerge uh, with the Biden administration and uh, the US government's um, efforts to be responsive to the demands of indigenous peoples. And I'm sure that organizations like National Congress of American Indians and others will play a role in some of this discussion. For Inuit and the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the UN Declaration and these specific international human rights standards are at the core of much of the work that we do either at intergovernmental organization dialogues around the world um, or within uh, the context of the Arctic Council. And I think the question for everyone is, what does the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples mean to us? It's important for Indigenous individuals and others to get their hands on a copy of it and to think about it in terms of how it should be interpreted for our own use because ultimately in terms of um, in terms of uh, these international standards they don't mean anything in the halls of the united nations where they mean something is right here on the ground in our own home communities and with our own people that's where that's where uh, these standards are significant so every day I think it's important to think about, are we enjoying the rights that are affirmed in the UN Declaration and other instruments? Are we exercising those rights? And if not, how do we move closer to that realization? So Kriyanak, thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, Oh, wow. What were you talking lecture and um, I feel like I'm going to have to listen to it once or twice again to, to put it all together. It seems like it would be a good introduction for our whole course on this, uh, the development and the elements and the various bodies that were involved. And it would be interesting to hear more about the various indigenous groups that were very active, like the ICC, in these various bodies. It's fascinating. And uh, in your work, uh, has been instrumental, I know, in this for, for a very long time. Um, one question that is uh, sort of you touched on is uh, how, how, what can we do at a local level or a regional level to, to implement these things or at least to uh, try to enact some of the key provisions 
My apologies for going on so long. I, uh, you know, when you put a PowerPoint up, it fills a whole screen and that it, I, I lost track of time. So um, I think that um, what I said at the conclusion of, of, um, of communities, and, and when I say communities, I, I mean the self in self-determination, that collectively uh, those within a community should uh, inform themselves about the rights affirmed and to really think about what they mean within their communities and begin, begin to chart agendas that uh, bring themselves to, again, the realization um, of the rights affirmed. And, and it, it sometimes seems like a, kind of a silly exercise, but I think it's an important exercise. It's harder to do at, on a statewide level, for example, you know, we, we have so much diversity uh, that, um, you know, even the challenge of, uh, of our hunting and fishing rights, uh, that there's extraordinary diversity. But if we take as one of the important guidelines, some of the language found in the UN Declaration concerning our, our rights to hunting, fishing, and other harvesting, that can give us, uh, I think, some important guideposts as to how to articulate an agenda or a strategy or a set of tactics to actually achieve that, that the exercise and enjoyment of those rights. Seems like that would be a good uh, committee for AFN to form to start mm. trying to do something like that. Mm. Another question is, um, how do we encourage our young indigenous leaders to engage in these conversations and understand the importance of the UNDRIP to their people? That's a really good question. Um, at the international level, there's a global indigenous youth caucus that's quite active. And so there's information that's circulated um, uh, through, the, through that particular caucus. Uh, in addition, any opportunity that you can uh, take to get to one of these sessions will be uh, will open up uh, doors that are, are just extraordinary. But also there are a host of different fellowship opportunities. Typically they do require an undergraduate degree at a minimum, but uh, there are fellowships at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. There are fellowships at the different agencies or specialized agencies of the United Nations. Also the OAS or the World Bank, um, I mean, there's just a flurry of, uh, of different opportunities. And so it's worth uh, taking a look at um, those fellowships or internships that are specific to indigenous peoples. Um, so I, I think there, there are a, a number of different opportunities that exist for, for uh, youth to get involved. Well, thank you again very much. This is most informative and uh... I'm glad we'll have it on YouTube to refer to in the future. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Oh no, thank thank you, uh, thank you, Chuck, and also to the to the institute overall. I appreciate the opportunity, and um, if there are those that are interested in the presentation, I'm happy to share it with you and. Um, uh, Maybe individuals can uh, request it from uh, SHI. For sure, yeah. We'll get a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah. Great. I would like to announce our next lecture series entitled, We Have Lived in Southeast Alaska Since Time Immemorial, which will describe the origins and earliest presence of indigenous populations and cultures in Southeast Alaska from traditional knowledge and different scientific perspectives. These lectures are scheduled in January and February of 2021. We have a link below the YouTube video for a survey we hope you will take a moment to complete. This will help us to continue improving our lecture series and allow our funders to measure the impact of the program. Thank you all again. See you again in the future. Rien